It's good to meet you in this next episode. In today's episode, we would be seeing Setu Bandha Sarvangasan. Setu means bridge, Bandha means formation. Hence, this pose is a bridge-like formation. It represents a bridge-like pose. Setuban Sarvangasan in the classical form is difficult to do, particularly for the injured or elderly. In the prop variations that we will showcase today, you will see how beautifully and systematically Sri BKS Sangar has maintained the essence of the pose Setubandha Sarvangasan and yet delivers a promise for every practitioner to be able to practice and reap from its practice as well. In today's episode, we will be seeing the first of the restorative poses. Setuban Sarvangasan is both a restorative pose as well as an inversion. It is an inversion because the head is at a lower position than the rest of the body and therefore this pose must be practiced for a long period of time. The length of practice can be of a longer duration. Setubandha Sarvangasan is con considered to be a variation of Sarvangasan itself. Since in the span of these 26 episodes, we still haven't seen independent Sarvangasan, we will not be proceeding with Setubandha Sarvangasan as a variation of Sarvangasan. Instead, we will use Chatushpadasan as an intermediary pose to showcase or demonstrate Setubandha Sarvangasan. In Iyengar Yoga, for Sarvangasan itself, we use a pile of blankets. Since Setuban Sarvangasan is its variation, here also we are using a pile of blankets to support the shoulder as well as the neck. So, keeping three blankets, one laid on top of the other symmetrically, we use the rounded end edges on the outside and the ruffled edges on the inside. The neck curves over the rounded edges and because the neck itself is a smooth curve, you want to make sure that it is the smooth edges on the outside and the ruffled edges are on the inside. Here, the practitioner lies back in the supine position where the shoulder is well placed on the pile of blankets and then the neck is not hanging midair, rather the curvature of the neck is supported by the pile of blankets on the smooth edge. Because it's a smooth curve of the neck, we want the smooth edge to be on the neck side, the ruffled edges to be on the inside. Again, if a practitioner was to go too far up, you see how the neck is hanging while you move to Setuban Sarvangasan or Sarvangasan with the neck not supported like this, it will add to strain in the neck region and the cervical vertebrae gets affected. So we move the shoulders around 2 to 3 inches away from the top of the blanket such that the neck is fully supported by the blanket and what touches the ground is the base skull or the occiput, the area around where the ponytail is. That base skull touches the ground, no other part of the head does. From this position, the practitioner then walks the feet back towards the buttock in such a way that both feet are aligned with the outer edges of the buttock, not the inner edges. Both feet are by the outer edges of the buttock. Coming to the shoulder, you should not raise the shoulder up in such a way that the chest is caving inwards. The edges of the shoulder should be firmly placed in a way that the collarbone is wide chest is wide, the entire area of the chest is well spread. From here, 
from the back of the shoulder, you will have to move the shoulder muscles back and then from the back of the shoulder, you will have to go down to hold your ankle. This gives the neck the necessary length. You must not move the front of the shoulder because it both shuts the neck space down and makes the chest compressed. So make sure you touch the edges of the shoulder and then from the back of the shoulder you will have to move, traction the muscles to go hold the ankles. After that, keeping the knees apart but not so apart that they are falling down, the knees have to be maintained at a hip distance. From there, pushing or activating the feet, the entire sole of the foot must be pressed onto the ground from where the practitioner raises the buttock and chest simultaneously. As you see, the buttock raises and then the chest raises up simultaneously. Sometimes what happens is the practitioner raises the buttock and leaves the chest hanging. This is a collapsed chest. This must not be done. So, you have to raise in such a way that you push the feet, raise the buttock with the chest. So, the buttock bone is active upward as much as the shoulder blade is. Both act communicating with each other. Shoulder blade in, buttock bone up, shoulder blade in, buttock bone up constantly. In fact, you have to make a few swinging actions up and down so that you get the mobility and the range of motion. Pressing the feet, raise the buttock, raise the chest. Do this a few times before you go into the final pose. Now, coming to the final position where the buttock is up and the shoulder blade is well integrated, as you can see, there's a good clearance away from the neck. The arms must be firmly pressed. So the base, as in the shoulder as well as the feet, are the resource points for raising the chest as well as the buttock upwards. From this position, a practitioner can walk a little closer and then raise the heels up so that raising that heel up will give more mobility to swing the hip upward and raise the chest up. The position should be where the sternum is vertically over the face, not falling backward. This is a wrong position. You have to build the dorsal spine ribcage forward in such a way that the sternum stands vertical. At this point, keeping the legs such that the knees are contained at hip width, the practitioner then has to place the hands at the ribs at the back. The hands must support the ribcage. The hands should not go towards the waist or buttock. The hands must be at the ribcage. Then, keeping the knees at hip width distance, you will have to then release one leg at a time. When you release one leg, the tendency is for the hip to drop. That shouldn't happen. You have to push the hip up and then release one leg at a time. When you go to the final pose, Setu Bandha, as the name suggests, bridge-like. This, as you can clearly see, is a bridge kind of a formation where pressing the feet, you have to mobilize the buttock upwards. Pressing the feet, you have to raise the chest up. In this, from the foot to head, from the foot to chest must be mobilized so the foot or knees are not dull. Pressing the thigh down, press the knee down, pressing the feet down, you have to raise the pose, chest vibrant. Being in this pose for around 30 to 60 seconds, the practitioner then walks back, releases the hands and then settles with the hip down. You can then stretch out the legs in, Shavasan or the lying down position. I would like to add at this point that this classical version of Setuban Sarvangasan is not easy for everybody to do. It requires a good tone and strength in the entire length of the spine. The wrists also must be in a position to hold weight. Here, I would like to add that when the wrist supports the ribcage, the chest doesn't fall in such a way that all the weight falls on the wrist. In fact, it is the contrary. The wrist provides the support using which the chest should raise up, not fall onto the wrists. Coming back, this pose it may not be possible for the elderly, disabled, injured or sick people to do. And therefore, Mr. BKS Iyengar has come up with various variations that facilitates this pose or makes it accessible for everybody to do. In the upcoming segment, we will see the variations.
We will now show you simple prop variations by which Setuban Sarvangasan may be done by everybody. Now, in the classical pose, when a person lifts the hip up, lifts the chest up and places the hand on the back, very many times the elbow falls wide. As you can see, as the elbow goes wide, the chest tends to fall. It's impossible to mobilize the chest up if the, he if the elbows are not held firm. If the elbows continue to go on slipping, the chest falls more and more. Now we will show you what to do for this using a belt. Here, a belt has been measured such that the belt is looped and then the loop of the belt itself is shoulder width apart. By shoulder width apart, it's from the edge of the shoulder to edge of the shoulder. This shoulder width apart is what the distance between the elbow actually must be. So here, once the practitioner has adjusted the shoulders down, adjusted the feet, etc., then the practitioner raises the hip up with the chest and then immediately wears this belt in such a way that the belt is strung just above the elbow. So there is the bone of the elbow, it's just above the elbow that the belt is placed. Then once the elbow is kept belted in such a way, there is no possibility for the elbow to slip and therefore using the stable platform of the elbow, then the arm may be bent to place under the back. So here as the arm is bent to place under the back, you can see the elbow doesn't slip and keeping that knit position of the elbow, there is a good platform to ripen the pose, raise the chest, raise the buttock, etc. This is used when a person doesn't have enough strength to keep the elbows together or their back shoulder, shoulder, shoulder muscles do not have the necessary mobility to get the elbows together. This is the way a belt can be used for the elbow. As we mentioned, Setuban Sarvangasan is the bridge-like position and hence whether it's classical or whether it's prop variations, that essence must be found. Now we will show a variation using a, two bolsters which is arranged in a crosswise manner. We keep first keep a horizontal bolster which is the lower bolster on top of which we keep a vertical bolster. This is why it's called cross bolster because it's got a cross like formation. The bolster, the vertical bolster is arranged centrally and then it's also arranged vertical in such a way that neither the top portion falls nor the bottom portion falls, it's center to center. After doing this, the practitioner then comes and sits on the extreme lower end of the vertical bolster. Sitting on the extreme lower end of the vertical bolster, you then lie back and keep coming down until the shoulder definitely touches the ground. The shoulder must not hang in the air, it will again cause neck strain. The shoulder must come and touch the ground. Once the shoulder touches the ground, the cervical neck, the head is moved away and the neck itself is lengthened. Here you see the same vibrant opening of the chest, the clearance for the cervical neck, these have all been established. From here, the practitioner lengthens one leg at a time. In such a way, the heels are away, as far away as possible. You have to extend the heel ligaments. So, the traditional Setuban Sarvangasan pose, which is a bridge kind of formation, is done. This is called Klaus Bolster Setuban Sarvangasan. I will add to this, as you can see here, the practitioner's feet are parallel. But for sometimes when you don't have control of the feet or if the practitioner wants to keep it absolutely restive, it's possible that the feet fall out like this. Falling out like this is not always desirable, but in order to keep it restive, as you will see while you are resting, there's a natural tendency for the feet to fall out. Now, what you then do is you use a belt around the outer edges of the feet in such a way, a practitioner can then open the foot, allow the foot to rest 
yet the belt keeps the foot aligned and doesn't allow the foot to completely fall out. So these are minute variations which can be constantly built to make the pose constantly refined more and more. As you can see here, the practitioner's shoulder is rested, head is rested, but the neck is not. The neck is still hanging. We already discussed before that the neck must be supported. In case a person doesn't have any neck problem whatsoever, this is okay to hold for a few minutes. But it's always good to support with a blanket in such a way that the blanket supports the edges of the shoulder and the neck and head in such a way that now there is no hanging of the neck. It is properly supported by a blanket. The shoulder is wedged in such a way that the edges of the shoulder are also not floating in the air. It's supported and there's a soft platform for the back of the head to rest on. This is good for the cervical neck. This is another variation that may be practiced. Moving to the third section, in case because of this arched shape, a restorative pose must be done for several minutes at a time. It may be 7 minutes, it may be 10 minutes, it may be 15 minutes, depending on the practitioner's need. When we go to a greater length of time, if a practitioner experiences back strain, then what can be done is the leg is supported using a bolster, such that the heel hinges are placed on the bolster. Here, that extreme arch is reduced, the leg is raised a little more, and therefore the strain on the back, if any, may be mitigated. These are the three variations that we have seen in cross bolster Setubandha Sarvangasana. We will now show you the next variation using a bench. This is called a Setubandha Sarvangasan bench. Nevertheless, if you are at home, you can also find a furniture of suitable height, let's say a bed without the mattress on top of it, and then you might use this to perform this pose. The poses that we've shown, the previous one as well as this, are considered to be highly restorative, and a practitioner may stay in it for several minutes at a time. So, using this bench, a practitioner sits in such a way that they face the end, that is the foot end of the bench. By foot end, I will let you know. You take the legs and put it up on the bench and then recline in such a way that you recline upon the bench in such a way that the shoulder is then rolled down towards the blanket. So, right now the shoulder as you see is hanging in the air but a practitioner must go down until the shoulder goes down towards the blanket. Remember we said in Setubandha Sarvangasana that the ribs must be supported by the palms. Here as you see, the last ribs are sharply supported by the bench and, though, and therefore this is an apt support or an apt variation. From here, after making sure that the shoulders are well placed, there must be no doubt that the shoulder is placed. If you do hesitate, make sure you take a few minutes to check that the shoulder is placed. If the shoulder hangs, it definitely affects or puts strain on the neck. That must not happen. Placing the shoulder down, you can hold the edges of the bench to sharply roll the shoulders back away from the neck so that the neck can be lengthened. Here, you then stretch one leg at a time in such a way that the heels are extended. This person, this student is much taller and therefore the heels are hanging. Essentially, the entire length of the heel is also supported by the bench. For this kind of a constitution, where the person is much longer, you may then use a pile of blankets that support the heel as well so that this heel is not left hanging. Here too the heel is hanging, you should then use an additional blanket to make sure the heel is also supported. Because the idea is to make the pose restive, when any area hangs it disturbs the restive nature of the pose. Here then the hands are released by the sides of the body and then you may be in this pose for several minutes at a time. 
In this manner, the heels are also supported by the blanket. So as you can see, every part of the trunk that is laid on the bench is supported. It's like lying down on a bed where just the aspect of lying down gives you relief. No part of the body is left hanging. The entire body is lying down on a supportive surface. This is important to note. Here, as you can see, there is a tremendous opening of the chest and a good length to the abdomen. Hence, the abdominal organs as well as the chest, the diaphragm, gets a tremendous opening. This is a variation of Setuban Sarvangasan that, as I mentioned, can be practiced for several minutes at a time. If a person is tired, one may also completely rest on this pose for up to half an hour. But this happens only as the practice builds up. We will now show you how to come out of the pose. This is particularly critical for Setubandha Sarvangasana being two reasons. One is it is an inversion. Second is it's a restorative pose. And so if you come out of it in a way that is harsh or disturbing, the quality of reju rejuvenation may be disturbed. Hence, you will have to make sure one leg is bent at a time. You have to take your time to do it. And then slowly the practitioner has to slide down in the direction of the head. Then once the buttock reaches the floor, you may remain in this position for a few seconds. Then you turn to the right side, keeping the right arm under the head like a pillow. Then pressing the left palm in front of you, you come up. This is important to follow. You will not come up in Setubandha Sarvangasan such that you just lift up in a way that the abdomen crunches that completely disturbs the pose, you must roll down in the manner shown. We now saw the classical pose Setubandha Sarvangasan as well as several prop variations. It is truly a marvel as to how Sri BKS Iyengar has envisioned the pose and created appropriate prop variations such that a person of truly any condition or disability can still practice it. All of these variations are very specific and purposeful. One must remember that prop arrangements must be made in a purposeful manner. It's not about using any prop in any manner there is. It has a definite intent and a definite reasons. All these variations have been showcased. Nevertheless, there are so many variations available for every single asana in Iyengar Yoga, depending on a person's condition, that showing every one of them is beyond the scope of these episodes. We have shown you the most pertinent ones or the ones that are widely used. Setuban Sarvangasan has several benefits. Because of the abundant chest opening in the pose, the area of the respiratory region is flushed with a lot of blood and as well as experiences a heightened amount of space. It therefore reduces pressure on the heart muscles as well as the artery. It prevents or reduces the chances of cardiac arrests as well as arterial blockages. Also, because the solar plexus is the center point of the chest, opening the diaphragm and the solar plexus gives a lot of restive, passive rejuvenation to the entire body. The heart, the brain, as well as the nerves are greatly relaxed. Hence, this pose is also used in the treatment of depression, anxiety, nervous tension, stress, etc. In the bench variation that we saw, because the length of the abdomen is so well and laterally as well as lengthwise opened. We have other variations in the bench such as Baddha Konasan that you also saw, which again rests yet opens the abdomen. It helps with disorders in one's menstrual cycle as well as conditions such as infertility, polycystic ovarian disorders, 
PMS, etc.